Hello, and welcome to American Catholic History, brought to you by the support of listeners like you. If you value this content, please become a supporter at AmericanCatholicHistory.org slash support. I'm Noelle Heaster Crow. And I'm Tom Crow. Thank you once again to our supporters. Your support really means a lot to us, and your monetary support makes it possible for us to keep making these episodes. We really couldn't do that, uh, keep doing this without you. But we also want to say thank you for just all your support and kind messages that you've given to us, especially over the last week as we've dealt with a little bit of a difficult time. Yeah, I mourned the passing of Macy, our beloved dog. So we, we did receive some very nice messages. So thank you to everyone who reached out and put comments on pictures we posted and um, just there, let us know how much you cared. That it really, really meant a lot to us. It wasn't all sad, though. We also appreciate your support for uh, Mr. Tom Crow's birthday oh, yeah. today, too. Yeah, <laughs> my birthday yesterday, actually. We're recording this on Thursday. My birthday was on Wednesday. So, yeah. so we want to say thank you. Thank you sincerely. Yes. And all of those, all of you who have considered becoming financial supporters, please join us. If you can find find our support levels and the perks offered at AmericanCatholicHistory.org slash support, and then join us via Patreon or Locals, your choice. And also, thank you for the reviews you leave on Apple, and especially those five-star ratings. They let Apple know that this is a great podcast and that more people should find it. Yes. So all of that said... On with the show. Today, we're talking about the oldest Catholic church in the state of Arkansas, St. Mary's in Plum Bayou, which dates back to 1782, right at the end of the American Revolution. Yeah, this little church is at the center of so much history. International politics, church politics, the Sisters of Loretto come into it, and there's even a potential saint in their graveyard. And the best part is this little church is still standing there in Plum Bayou, surrounded by its old graveyard. It's a testament to perseverance, hard work, and love. Yeah, it really is. And this is somewhat of a unique episode for us. The story actually came to us from a listener, and a lot of the information came directly from the folks at the parish itself, because very little is actually available online. Yeah, we were tipped off by Dan Strasser, who wrote, I have been coming to Pine Bluff, Arkansas my whole life because that is where my mom was born and raised. Surprisingly, now in my 46th year, I just learned that the oldest church in Arkansas is a little Catholic church still standing just outside of Pine Bluff. St. Mary's was established before Arkansas was even a state. It was constructed on a barge for use at the fort before being moved to land. If you have not already done it, I think it would be a great story for our American Catholic history. I love your show and pray for your success. Thanks for all you do. Well, thank you, Dan Strasser, for the prayers and for the tip. This was a fascinating story to do research on. After I didn't find much online, I actually broke down and, you know, called St. Joseph Parish, which takes care of the old church. First, they invited me to come by for Mass at the old church. I explained I was at least a 14-hour drive in Steubenville, Ohio, but I would love to talk with someone who knew a lot about the parish. So Kathy, who had answered the phone, put me in touch with Jim, who was a great source of information. He sent me all kinds of news clippings and historical documents. So from that information, plus some broader context and historical background that is more readily available online, we put this episode together. (laughs) That's right. So with the help of... Dan Strasser, let's talk about St. Mary's. Absolutely. And Jim, your new friend. Right, yes. (laughs) St. Mary's current location is this church's third home, and though it was originally constructed of wood, it is now covered with brick. But under that brick is still the same church that was originally built on a barge in 1782, floating on the Arkansas River. And honestly, those two facts, it was built on a barge during the Revolutionary War, were what really intrigued me about this story. You know, Arkansas is the Bible Belt. It is not among the more Catholic places in America. Out of a population of 3 million, only about 126,000 are Catholic, so that's only about 4%. Catholics are outnumbered by Southern Baptists, United Methodists, and even those who attend independent non-denominational churches. Yeah, and this is actually the first episode we've done on something specifically in Arkansas. Yeah, which I'm really glad we're doing because we want to have something on every 
from every single state. Mm -hmm. And when you look at how politics, the institutional church really jerked Arkansas around over the years, it's actually little wonder that the Catholic Church didn't retain the dominance that it had early on in its history. But the Catholics in Arkansas have a long, long history, and they will forever be able to say that they were the first to bring Christianity to that region. Yes, the first Catholic Mass offered in modern-day Arkansas was way back in 1541. That's more than 250 years before Protestants really started moving into the area. That mass was offered by priests who traveled with the Spanish explorer Hernando de Soto, the first European to come upon and cross the Mississippi River. Which he called the River of the Holy Spirit. It's a good trivia question. It is, yes. Yeah. That was the first name given to it by Europeans, you're right, but de Soto and his expedition didn't establish a settlement in that area. That didn't happen for another 140 years. Right, and that was done by Frenchmen. The French, led by Robert Cavalier, Sieur de La Salle, explored the region and established settlements and forts to build up the fur trade and establish good relations with the native populations. This particular area was settled by one of La Salle's lieutenants, Henri de Tonti, in 1686. He chose the location because it is near where the Arkansas River flows into the Mississippi. He named the settlement Arkansas Post, Except he said it in French. Of course. All right. And he, no, took, we. <laughs> he took the name Arkansas from the Algonquin word for the tribe that lived in the area. Those natives, the tribe that lived in the area, called themselves the Quapaw. But since the French worked with the Algonquin speaking natives a lot more, they went with Arkansas. Right. So the French set up shop in the area both to control this part of the lower Mississippi River basin against any potential incursions by the English or Spanish and to do some fur trading. Priests came and went, bringing the sacraments to the Catholic Frenchmen who lived at Arkansas Post, but none was long term and they didn't have a permanent church building. And there were probably two big reasons for that. One, the population was never that large and it fluctuated because fur trading had never flourished and agricultural ventures failed. Two, the site of the fort itself had to change from time to time because the Arkansas River kept moving around. As the bends in the river eroded the land, the fort would have to be moved to avoid being washed away. Well, the Catholics finally came up with a solution. In 1782, some of the French Catholic civilians in the area finally decided to build themselves a chapel that wouldn't be affected by the changing river course. They built it on a barge floating in the river. The river could move and the water level could go up and down. The church didn't care. It remained upright and steady as the world moved around it. <laughs> kind of an allegory there, you could say. The bark of Peter riding on the tides of history. Yeah, seriously. It reminds me actually of my favorite motto for a religious community, Stat crucis dum vovitur ur orbis. It's uh, the cross stands while the world turns. It's the motto for the Carthusians. And for another fact that's just too much of a coincidence, they built the church out of cedar timbers and shingles. It's dedicated in honor of St. Mary, and it's made of cedar, which is a traditional symbol of the Blessed Virgin Mary. No wonder it's lasted. Exactly. Anyhow, this floating house of cedar was not large, but that was okay because it didn't have a large congregation to serve. It did, however, have a bell in the tower, a bell brought over from France. So now they had a church with a bell to ring out the Angelus and Vespers. But the priest situation wasn't stabilized. Which is not all that surprising. No, it really isn't. Let's take a look at what was going on outside of Arkansas Post during those decades to see why. Well, in 1763, the French lost the Seven Years' War, known in American history as the French and Indian War. With that loss, France was forced to cede the entire Louisiana colony which included Arkansas, to Spain. So the French, who lived in Arkansas Post and all over Arkansas, were suddenly subjects of the Spanish crown with Spanish troops and governors taking over administration. This caused some tension, though fortunately the Spanish were also Catholics, so you didn't have the unpleasantness like what happened in Quebec when the Protestant English took over. Then the American War of Independence broke out in 1775. That war took the attention of the English, French, and Spanish governments. But that war was raging way to the east in the British-controlled colonies, with the exception of one battle, the Colbert Raid in April of 1783, 
That war didn't matter to Arkansas Post. Then, due to the changing political realities in Europe, Spain agreed to give the entirety of their Louisiana colony back to France in 1800, with the transfer being completed in 1802. But the French didn't actually come back to take over administration. Just one year later, in 1803, France sold the Louisiana Territory to the United States. So now, Arkansas was an American territory. Now the American Revolution mattered. Yes. <laughs> Becoming an American territory stabilized things politically. The region was no longer a commodity to be passed among European governments. It was a possession of the sovereign nation nearest to it. But it didn't quite stabilize things for the church in the region. When the United States took possession of Louisiana, Rome moved quickly, which is kind of a miracle in itself, to bring that vast territory under the jurisdiction of John Carroll, the Bishop of Baltimore, and the only bishop in the United States at that point. And this was good and a sign of future stability, but that stability was still some time away. The changing political realities of the previous 70 years had meant the area was moved among different dioceses a number of times. When Rome said, Baltimore was now in charge, the bishops and priests who had administered the territory weren't happy. Also, John Carroll, like the other bishops of the previous dioceses who were based in like Durango and Havana, Cuba, were really far away. John Carroll was not, like them, able to send priests out there in great numbers or to monitor what was going on. The Diocese of St. Louis would be, would, would be established in 1826, and all of Arkansas would be within that vast diocese, but that was still years away. A whole lot happened before the first bishop of St. Louis, Joseph Rosati, was able to get a permanent priest to Arkansas Post in 1832. First, a disgruntled priest from Bargetown moved across the Mississippi and spent about a year in Arkansas Post charging fees, exorbitant ones at that, for sacraments. He was, rightly, run out of town by the people who had no interest in paying for sacraments. And good for them, but man, what kind of damage did his actions do to their faith? Next, well, yeah, that's a good question, right? Next, there is a priest who was sent by the hierarchy, but he was so incapable of working with the people that he also turned everyone off. Within a couple of years, he fled, never to return. Beginning in 1826, a priest named Father Beaupre began coming once per year. He did not like the task, dreaded going every time he had to, and he actually referred to the area as a suburb of hell. But he went and did what he could to undo the damage of the previous two priests and the many years of not having a priest. Also challenging the work of the priests was the massive influx of non-Catholic Americans. Yes. Up until the Louisiana Purchase, Catholicism was the dominant religion of the region. Now, there were never more than 1,000 Catholics in all of Arkansas up to this point, but there were so few Europeans or Americans overall and so few uh, converts among the natives that that made Catholics the largest religious group. Catholicism also enjoyed the support of the French and Spanish governments. Well, that changed when Arkansas became part of the USA. Baptists and Methodists and other Protestants began flocking to the new territory. By the middle of the 1850s, Catholics made up only 1% of the population of Arkansas. And the population grew so rapidly after the Louisiana Purchase that Arkansas was able to become the 25th state of the Union in 1836. At the time of statehood, there were only about 700 Catholics in the state, and Father Enamon Dupuy, whom we'll talk about shortly, was the only Catholic priest in the entire state. So the Catholics of Arkansas were vastly outnumbered, and they were underserved by the church's hierarchy. But they had one thing that was rare. They had a church, one of very few west of the Mississippi in those early days. Yes, and it was a fine structure for the times. As we said, it was built of heavy timbers and covered with cedar shingles. That construction was the finest and most substantial method available in the region because there were no stone quarries since the land for miles around was all river deposits from millennia of shifting riverbeds. At some point in the early 1800s, the barge with St. Mary's Church was towed a few miles upriver from Arkansas Post to the growing community of Pine Bluff. In 1832, St. Mary finally got its first resident pastor, the aforementioned Father Enamon Dupuy. Dupuy, a native of France, poured himself into the work and found out very early on how difficult his task would be. 
In a letter to Bishop Rosati about the state of the faith in the area, he said, It will take 10 years of work, of patience, of bodily sufferings and heartache before we may look for any spiritual improvement amongst these people. It is useless to speak to them of abstinence, fasting, or confessions, or of the duty to marry before a priest. In fact, he reported to Bishop Rosati that the people believed a marriage contracted before a priest was no good. He also lamented the bad effects that itinerant Protestant preachers had on the population, including on Catholics. Many of them preached the most awful lies about the church, and there were so many of them that he had great difficulty undoing the damage. But he didn't despair. He laid plans instead. First, he acquired land for the church. After 50 years of living on a barge, St. Mary Church was dismantled board by board and rebuilt on land. Second, he established a graveyard. Father Dupuis led the Catholics of Arkansas until 1837, when he was replaced by his assistant, Father Peter Donnelly. Donnelly was only in charge for about a year when Father Joseph Richard Bull arrived in 1838. And Father Bull did something important. He invited the Sisters of Loretto to start a school for girls. Yes, he asked the Mother House in Loretto, Kentucky for sisters to help teach the faith in Arkansas. Five Sisters of Loretto answered the call in 1838, led by Mother Agnes Hart coming from St. Genevieve, Missouri. They quickly established a school on land near Pine Bluff donated by Colonel Creed Taylor. They had 40 students when they opened their doors in October of 1838, and the school quickly gained a good reputation and drew students from the best families. But the financial situation on the frontier was strained for everyone, even the best families, and the school was beset by financial difficulties from the outset. Another blow to the sisters' ministry was the death of their mother superior, Mother Agnes, who died of malaria in August 1839. According to the records of the Sisters of Loretto, Mother Agnes was one of the most revered and respected sisters in the order, and her death was mourned by all within the order and in the community there in Pine Bluff. They buried her without a coffin, as was the custom of the time, but the records say that those who buried her believed they were burying a saint. So they laid a bed of roses in her grave before lowering her down. After Mother Agnes's death, the Sisters of Loretto soldiered on in Pine Bluff, as well as in other schools they established nearby in Arkansas Post and up in Little Rock. But they faced stiff headwinds everywhere there in Arkansas. They only lasted a few more years in Pine Bluff before shifting their focus to Arkansas Post and Little Rock but they faced the same difficulties at every one of their Arkansas houses. Little wealth in the community to pay tuition, not many Catholic families to draw from, an adverse climate, and a strong anti-Catholic strain among the population at large. The Sisters of Loretto closed all their schools and left Arkansas by 1845. However, they did award the first diplomas ever given in the state of Arkansas during their years in operation. When the sisters left, the body of Mother Agnes Hart remained behind in the churchyard of St. Mary. And that is a great reason to talk about the next time St. Mary's moved, this time to its present day location. Right. We mentioned earlier that the forts built at Arkansas Post had to be abandoned and rebuilt a few times due to the shifting of the course of the Arkansas River. Well, the river didn't stop its meandering ways. During the 1840s, the river course changed and began to threaten the church and its graveyard. Some of the early graves, including that of Father Bull, were claimed by the Arkansas as it drew ever closer to the church itself. In 1851, the structure was moved one more time to its present location in Plum Bayou, a safe distance from the river. All of the remaining bodies in the graveyard were exhumed and carefully reburied in the graveyard at the new church, with their original markers brought and lovingly put in place. And among those bodies exhumed and reburied was Mother Agnes Hart. But she was different. When they exhumed her body, witnesses claimed that her body was not decayed. They said that her body was petrified. Nowadays, we might say she was incorrupt. At the time, they didn't make a huge deal out of it, apart from noting the fact and recording it for posterity. 
But if she really was incorrupt, that's kind of a big deal. Uh, Yeah, I'd say it is. And at at any rate, Mother Agnes was reburied in a coffin. And in the 1880s, several students who had attended the Sisters of Loretto School erected a six-foot marble monument at her grave. But that wasn't the end of Mother Agnes' story, and she may well have a canonization in her future. Interest in her rekindled in 2007 when a new pastor at St. Joseph became curious about the sister whose portrait hung on the rectory wall. The pastor, Father Warren Harvey, looked into her story and was amazed to read that she'd been found incorrupt. When a parishioner at St. Joseph, Gregory Maddox, was diagnosed with terminal cancer, Father Harvey had Maddox, his wife, and the whole parish community pray to Mother Agnes for a miraculous cure. Maddox's wife later reported that the day they started praying for Mother Agnes's intercession was the day her husband's health began to turn for the better. Within a short time, Maddox was declared cancer-free, a result that the doctors themselves called near-miraculous. But Mother Agnes's grave might have been lost to history if not for a restoration project that took place nearly 100 years ago. Old St. Mary fell out of use in 1903 after St. Joseph and Pine Bluff became the dominant local Catholic church. St. Mary sat, forgotten and deteriorating, until 1927. A daughter of one of the old Catholic families in the area, Emma Vaugine White, came upon the old church and determined to restore and preserve it as a memorial to her son who had died. White's Vagine ancestors had worshipped at St. Mary's for generations, and a number of her ancestors were buried in the graveyard there. She did not want to see that original church just disappear into history, with its gravestones lost to weeds and overgrowth. She sought and received permission from the Diocese of Little Rock to do the restoration. Within a very short time, she had the old walls restored, new cedar boards replacing those that had deteriorated, and eventually she had the entire structure clad in brick to preserve it for the long haul. Before she died, she made St. Mary Church her sole beneficiary, directing that the income from her estate should be used to maintain St. Mary's in perpetuity. Emma Vagine White is herself buried in St. Mary's graveyard near the grave of her son. And so today, St. Mary still stands. Jefferson County, where it is located, is less than 2% Catholic. The entire state is still heavily Protestant. But the people of St. Joseph Parish in Pine Bluff love their old church, the oldest in the state, and one of the oldest west of the Mississippi. They are the keepers of the grave of a potential saint, as well as one of the great and typical stories of Catholicism in America, a little church that persevered. This has been American Catholic History. If you enjoy American Catholic History, please become a supporter. We've got great perks for supporters. Get information on how to become a supporter and the perks at AmericanCatholicHistory.org slash support. Also on our website, sign up for our newsletter, learn more about St. Mary and Plum Bayou, plus see about our pilgrimages and find other great stories from American Catholic History. We also love the great reviews our listeners leave. Those and the five-star ratings help others find us. You can email us feedback, questions, tips for episodes, and topics like the one we did today, and other comments at feedback at AmericanCatholicHistory.org. You can find us on Facebook at Facebook.com slash American Catholic History, on Instagram at ACH underscore podcast, and follow us on Twitter at ACH1513. I'm Noelle Heaster Crow. And I'm Tom Crow. Thank you once again for joining us on American Catholic History, made possible by listeners like you.